All right, so we've just finished looking at uh, quiz six. Let's go over some announcements. Um, we're at class 29, which means we've just got today's class and then on Thursday, and that's it as far as instruction in the semester. So we have to start thinking more acutely uh, about the final exam. It'll be a week from Thursday, starting at 8. And uh, the format's going to be very closely related to what you've seen before, where there's a, a first part of the exam, which is devoted to concept questions. And you can't use any equation sheet uh, during that first section, where it's mostly short answer. But then on the second part of the exam, uh, you'll be solving problems. And you should have access to Microsoft Excel uh, for the problem solving. And so bring a computer with a charged battery or the ability to plug in. Uh, make sure that it has an internet connection that works and is able to connect to Marshall's Wi-Fi because you're going to be uploading the file that you create. Uh, you won't be able to use any pre-existing Excel files. You can't start with like an in-class exercise or a homework. You need to start from a scrap, uh, like a blank worksheet. I'll provide the uh, factor tables that you may need and these equations. So these equations will be provided, but with your uh, one page front and back of notes, you need to include any other information uh, that you may want to rely on for problem solving. So we can talk a little bit more about the exam on Thursday, but are there any questions so far about the information I've given you? All right, the, uh, the exam is naturally comprehensive, and so it would be impossible for me to give you an exam that doesn't kind of build on the concepts from earlier on the course, but there will be added emphasis on the material that we've covered since the second midterm exam. So what that means is that uh, you know, a greater fraction of the points are gonna be on the more recent material, but I probably will throw in some of just the basic time value of money stuff from the earlier in the semester, you know, like where I'm asking you to interpret a cash flow diagram or maybe take a table and turn it into a cash flow diagram or you know, solve for P given A, that sort of stuff. And so you can expect just about anything to be on the test, but more of the points are going to come from the recent stuff. All right. Well, today we're going to be talking about taxes. And uh, specifically, we're talking about sales tax, value-added taxes, a special classification of tax known as an excise tax and property. And then in class on uh, Thursday, we're going to be talking about income taxes. So we'll need an entire class period to go through that because uh, income taxes can be a little bit complicated. All right. <clears throat> so remember, you're already thinking about the final exam, and you want to get ready for that. So uh, consider this as another spot check. Would you be able to do a uh, convincing short answer response to the following statements or questions? And so briefly explain the repeatability assumption. Now that's reaching back into the archives a little bit. Does anybody remember what is the repeatability assumption? Yeah. Very good. Very good. And the only other thing that goes along with that, and that you're also assuming it's going to generate the same revenues. And so that's excellent response. So the repeatability assumption is used, remember, when we're comparing alternatives with different useful lives, we have to make them match up so they have the same number of useful lives. And so sometimes we repeat using the least common multiple approach so that maybe if we had one thing that lasts for three years and one that lasts for four, then we'd run them in cycles until it terminates at 12 years, which is the least common multiple. The repeatability assumption says, yeah, that's great to do that, but keep in mind you're assuming that the equipment <coughs> that you're buying now can be bought again in the future for the same price. So it's just uh, keeping in the back of our mind um, the notion that built into just repeating those cycles is uh, a guess that the prices will be the same and so will the revenues. So, very good. What about this? So, what if you can't use repeatability? So that means we're not going to utilize the least common multiple approach. Do you remember what are uh, two other methods for comparing projects or alternatives with different useful lives? 
Okay, early termination is one. Contract services is the other. Very good. All right, so both of those are ways of making the alternatives end in the same number of years. And if you don't remember what early termination or contract services are, then uh, that's something that I'd invite you to revisit in your notes. All right, what's the advantage of the external rate of return method compared to the internal rate of return method of project analysis? So what's the advantage of ERR? Describe it in terms of an advantage. Anyone remember how these two are different? One's more difficult to calculate. Do you remember which one is harder to calculate? Why is ERR harder to calculate? Okay. Yeah, you have to you have to do something to the future. That is part of it. Yeah. Anybody else remember what what's another uh, component of what makes external rate of return a little more complicated than internal rate of return? Yes. Exactly right. So uh, she's recalling that the uh, revenue you earn in the external rate of return method, you're not assuming it can be reinvested into the project. And so the advantage is the method allows for you to take the money and invest it somewhere else. And so it's kind of like a weighted average. The external rate of return takes into account the earnings that you're going to receive from the project and also the earnings you're going to receive from those profits that have been invested someplace else. And so you're, you're averaging those two rates of earnings together. And so that's the advantage of it. It's more realistic. There aren't very many situations where every dollar of a project can be reinvested back into that same project. And so more often than not, you'll have to use the external rate of return method because uh, your profits are going to have to go somewhere else. Okay, this is a pretty basic one. Why is money now more valuable than money in the future? Can you explain? If you just said inflation, I'd give you maybe half credit for that. But Okay. You got that last statement backwards. The five dollars now is worth more than five dollars in the future. But yeah, you're definitely on the right track. So he mentioned inflation, and what's inflating is because sometimes people get prices are inflating, and so what that means is that costs are going up. And therefore, the value of each dollar is going down because you can buy fewer things because the costs are going up. So what that means is that $5 now, as he said, $5 now is more valuable than $5 in the future because in the future, you won't be able to buy as many things as you can buy with that $5 now. Ooh, it's been a long time since we talked about BC. What does BC stand for? Benefit cost, all right. And I ask you, identify one shortcoming with the B to C method. And so the B to C method's not perfect. No method's perfect. So what are one of the weaknesses of the benefit cost method? Ooh, this is giving me some good uh, clues on what to ask you on the exam. All these empty stairs. Okay, yeah, right? So who can elaborate? You're definitely on the right track. So he's saying you're putting a value on something that you don't know the value to. What does he mean? Do you remember what are the components in the benefit cost method? Some of the things we know, some of the things we estimate. What, are we, what do we know and what are we estimating in the B2C method? Okay, the costs can be calculated in a direct way. You know, you're going to get a bill from a contractor or from a part supplier 
but then some things have to be kind of guessed at. Benefits and disbenefits. And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to put a dollar value on things like a reduction in traffic accidents or the joy of a child going fishing at a pond. What's that worth, right? Nothing. That's what it's worth. Uh, <laughs> or uh, disbenefits. What is the dollar cost of uh, it being 10 decibels louder outside your window from 4 a.m. till 8 a.m.? How much would you pay to have that go away? Or you know, how much less productive does it make you in the following afternoon? It's tough to estimate those things. And economists will spend months and years trying to do their best estimating them. But that is a weakness, is that a lot of it is just you know, pulling a rabbit out of a hat and hoping that it's accurate. OK. So we'll go over another list like this on, uh, <coughs> on Tuesday. But I mean, it's not like these particular concepts are more important than some of the others. I'm just picking some ideas at random to illustrate, oh, there's a lot of stuff that you used to know, or maybe you used to be supposed to know, and that uh, just need to be reviewing things in a general way before the exam. OK. So everyone has, probably everyone here has shopped at Walmart before. And even if you haven't, you've seen a receipt where at the bottom, it's breaking out the, the, uh, the total of all the, the things that you're buying, a subtotal, and then taxes added on top of that. Now, uh, for whatever reason, this receipt is showing like two different tax categories, something at 2.5% and, and another thing, but it's at the same 2.5%. In some states, they uh, charge one tax rate for goods and a different tax rate for food. Now, here in West Virginia, we're a little bit lucky because I think we pay zero on food, uh, but we still pay sales tax on other goods like clothing or you know, sporting goods and so on. Um, so sales tax is added as a percentage of the items that are being purchased. And it's not just here in the United States that we have sales tax. Uh, here is a receipt from uh, Switzerland. Now, the difference between the United States and a lot of other countries is that often in other places, the price that you see on the shelf already includes the sales tax. It's just kind of like here when you're buying gasoline. You know, like when it says 209 on the sign, that's you're actually paying 209. It's not going to be 209 plus some sales tax on top of that. So the difference is whether the, uh, the price on the shelf includes the sales tax or not. And actually, it's pretty uncommon here in the States that you'll see the sales tax included price quoted. Uh, the only exceptions I can think of is um, maybe if you're at a sporting event, you know, when they say hot dogs are 250, or I guess it'd be more like 650 for a hot dog. You know, that's the price that includes the sales tax, because they just know that if some guy's going up and down the aisle, he doesn't want to be counting pennies. Um, for giving you your change. All right, so that's one thing that's kind of nice when you're traveling overseas is that you don't have to worry about adding the sales tax on after the fact in your mind to figure out if you've got enough money. It's just built in. Um, but more countries outside of the United States have something that's not sales tax. It's known as a value-added tax. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But what I wanted to show you first is a, a figure of local sales tax rates, a state and local sales tax rates combined, and how they vary across the country. Because uh, there are some states like Oregon and Montana, uh, oh, and also New Hampshire, that don't charge any sales tax. Uh, there are other states that have very low sales tax. If you look at Alaska, it's, it kind of makes you wonder why they even bother in Alaska. It's only 1.76%. So that's nice and low. Uh, but then, thank goodness we don't live in Louisiana, right? 10% is the sales tax in Louisiana. So that's pretty high. You know, here in West Virginia, the 6.37% that we pay as a statewide tax, um, that ranks 32nd in the nation. So it's uh, lower than average, lower than average. So why do you think that the sales tax varies so much from state to state? OK, they have different things they need to pay for. 
Um, what you can bet is that in Oregon, they probably have higher other taxes. You know, if, if they're not collecting any sales tax, then they're going to have to get the money from somewhere. And so the other tax categories, like property tax or income tax, are probably a little bit higher than in their sales tax. Um, and then there are some situations, like in the case of Alaska, where the state gets so much revenue from oil and gas leases that what we'll see is that they have relatively low income tax, relatively low property tax, relatively low sales tax because uh, you know, Alaska is collecting revenue on its natural resources. One other kind of thing to consider is uh, what about towns that are on the border of Oregon and California? Where do you think people go grocery shopping? Or where do you think people go to do their back to school or Christmas shopping? <laughs> They're not driving over the border to California, right? Because you can get an 8% discount by going to Oregon. And uh, what's another way that you can avoid sales tax? Like here in West Virginia, let's see who's surrounding. We could, we could go to Kentucky and instead of 6.37, pay 6. Or we could go to Pennsylvania, instead of 6.37, we could pay 6.34. That kind of hardly justifies driving to Pennsylvania, though, right? <laughs> so how can you save money on sales tax? What's that? Amazon. Amazon? It used to be that Amazon didn't collect any sales tax. Now they collect sales tax on purchases from Amazon, but then like their third-party market sellers, they don't collect sales tax for them. Um, eBay, there's no sales tax on eBay. A lot of websites aren't collecting sales tax, but uh, the state of West Virginia, when you're filing your annual income tax, they ask you, how much did you buy online this year? And they want you to say, I bought, you know, I, I keep track of all my online purchases and I bought $600 and so here's the money now. Um, I don't know if they collect very much revenue that way, but legally you're supposed to keep track of all your online purchases and pay that sales tax that wasn't collected at the time of purchase. You're supposed to pay that at the time of your uh, income tax return. So in a way, it's actually kind of nice that Amazon has started collecting sales tax because it means you're not, you're not in the position of needing to uh, keep track of it yourself. All right, so sales tax are usually, it's only applied one time. It's only one transaction. It's applied when the retailer collects money from the end buyer. Sales tax isn't collected uh, in intermediate steps. Like if the item is a t-shirt, sales tax isn't collected when the uh, cotton grower sells to the middleman. Or when the middleman provides the raw cotton to a textile mill, there isn't sales tax there. Generally, sales tax is only applied in that final transaction. And sometimes sales tax isn't applied for services. That's a thing that varies from place to place as well, whether the sales tax is applied like to uh, uh, dentistry or to your cable bill. I mean, it, it's generally applied to goods, but sometimes it's also applied to services. Now, in contrast to sales tax, which is relatively simple, there is a value-added tax that's been used in a lot of other countries. And at first glance, it seems just bewilderingly complicated. And you wonder, why would they ever do it? But what they found is with value-added taxes, there's less of an incentive for a black market. And so um, you know, it, it doesn't happen as much in the United States, but a lot of other countries have problems with goods being sold without having been taxed properly. And here, there's a little bit of an issue, like someone will buy cigarettes from Kentucky and drive it to New York City and sell them in New York City without paying like the $6 a pack taxes that, that are levied in New York City. Um, so value-added taxes are a way of spreading out the burden of taxation on everyone. Because remember, one of the things of the sales tax is that it's only applied on that final transaction. And so the, the final purchaser is the one who uh, assumes all of the burden. Whereas there are a lot of other people in that chain who are making money and we're getting, um, getting some benefit from a purchase, but it's only the last person who's paying the taxes. And so sales tax doesn't spread out the burden of taxation very evenly, whereas a value-added tax does. 
And so let's follow how value-added tax works in this illustration. So this first step is a farmer grows cotton and sells it to a textile maker. So a certain amount of cotton gets sold for a dollar. If the value-added tax is 10%, then what that means is that the seller actually pays a dollar ten because it's a dollar for the cotton, and the farmer collects ten cents uh, to give to the government. Now, in the next step, the textile maker who just bought that cotton, they're going to make clothing and they sell it. I'm sorry, they make fabric and they sell it to the clothing maker for five dollars. And so, if the tax is ten percent. And that means the actual sales price is $5.50 because it's the $5, which was the purchase price of the item, plus 50 cents to cover the tax. Well, the textile maker previously paid 10 cents uh, for the cotton, and so that means they get to keep that 10 cents for themselves, and they only have to give 40 cents to the, to the government. And so they're only having to pay tax on the value added. And so value added is the difference between the purchase price and the sales price. And so you look at what did that textile maker do? The textile maker did, did something that took a $1 item and turned it into a $5 item. And so the difference between the starting price and the final price is $4. And so the textile maker added $4 of value, and that's how much tax the textile maker has to pay to the government is 10% of that value, so 40 cents. So instead of paying a percentage of the total price, you're only paying a percentage of how much you benefit. And so the, uh, the textile maker benefited $4 in that step. Does everybody understand the idea of value added? The, the value added is the difference between what you're selling it for, and what you bought it for. And so let's look at another step. The clothes maker uh, is going to sell the shirt to the retailer for $12. And so let's think, what's the value? The difference between the shirt that they bought from the textile, I'm sorry, the fabric that they bought from the textile maker was $5. They're selling it for $12. And so $7 is the incremental value added. And so the tax that they have to pay since the step is $7, they have to pay 10% of that. So they're going to pay 70 cents, but they're collecting the VAT tax of um, $1.20 because the uh, $12 is the sales price. 10% of that is $1.20, but they only have to pay 70 cents to the government. So they get to keep 50 cents, and that covers the tax that they paid in the previous step. It seems, it seems confusing, I know, but the point is, is that any time you add value, you're only paying tax on how much value you added. And so you're essentially getting reimbursed for all of the taxes that you've paid that isn't representing the value you added. And so then the consumer buys the shirt, like the, the shirt sells for $20, 10% of that is two, and so that's what the seller is collecting, and 80 cents is uh, paid to the government because the $1.20 gets to be kept by the retailer to cover all of the value-added tax from the previous step except for the 70 cents. So uh, what I'd suggest you do to like burn this into your memory is Go through these calculations. You know, set them aside, put them somewhere you can't see them, and then tonight just say, all right, I know these steps, $1, $5, 12 and 20 So calculate, like make the table, sales price with VAT, VAT collected by seller, and so on. And just kind of fill in the table so it reinforces in your mind who's paying what, when do they get the refund, and so on. And then it'll be etched in your memory and you'll understand the value-added tax. This is something that is being adopted in a lot of countries that didn't previously have any taxes. Um, like I, I've told you before that I used to live in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, when I was living, living there, there was no property taxes, uh, there's no sales taxes, there's no income taxes. There's no Medicare, FICA, 
Social Security, none of that. It's just like if your employer is giving you $50,000, then you get $50,000. It was great. Uh, but they, I think they realized that uh, a government can't exist without collecting some taxes. And so they looked at all these possibilities, like how are we going to start getting some revenue? And uh, economists give them advice. And the most efficient tax you can levy is a value-added tax. And that's what they started to implement. It's really low. Um, I think they're moving towards maybe 2 and a half or 3% value-added tax. But it's the one that, from like an economic theory standpoint, makes the most sense. Uh, because there's, it minimizes the incentive to cheat and to create kind of like a black market side economy. And it spreads out the burden of taxation on everybody. OK, um, gas taxes. You know, fuel is so cheap right now. I saw, as I was driving into work today, there's several stations that are selling for uh, 209. And I mean, that's the cheapest I remember for a long, long time. Um, when I first moved to West Virginia back in January of 2009, it was down below $2 for a couple of weeks. But that's because the economy was kind of imploding, and things were really bad then. Um, so the 209 that you see on the pump includes the actual cost of the fuel, and it also includes state and federal taxes. And so the state and federal taxes, maybe as you're gassing up your car, you've seen the stickers that are on the pumps. And the stickers, sometimes you can see they have on the pumps, it tells you how many cents per gallon you're paying. And so here in West Virginia, the state tax on fuel is 32.2 cents per gallon. And then there's a federal tax of 18.4 cents per gallon. And that money is supposed to go specifically towards the uh, construction and maintenance of highways. Um, but the, uh, the fuel taxes vary a lot from state to state. You look at, if you're going up to Pennsylvania, you definitely want to fill up the car before you make the trip, because their fuel taxes in Pennsylvania are 58.2 58, 58 cents per gallon. Um, just as the, uh, the state component of the tax. And then the federal is also 18.4 cents per gallon on top of that. So between here in Pennsylvania, you can expect that the uh, fuel is you know, consistently going to be about 25 cents a gallon more expensive. One thing that I often notice is um, I fly into North Carolina about five times a year to go work on the engineering licensing exam. Uh, because I fly into Charlotte, and I drive down to South Carolina. South, uh, in Clemson, South Carolina is where the headquarters of NCEES is. And they're the ones who they write that exam, and I volunteer there. And so when I drive over the state line, it's, re it's remarkable. You go from North Carolina, where the fuel taxes is 34 cents a gallon, and then South Carolina has some of the cheapest fuel taxes in the nation. Uh, Alaska is the, one that, the only one that's less. And they do that because of what I've told you before. Alaska has so much natural resources. They don't need to tax the people as much. Uh, but you drive over that state line, and the fuel is instantly about 20 cents a gallon cheaper. And so it's really noticeable. Down in South Carolina, they have nice, cheap gas. So a uh, gasoline tax is an example of an excise tax. And an excise tax is a special category of taxes where it's applied uh, just to that item in question. And it's over and above sales taxes. And so sales tax applies to usually everything except for food in most states, uh, whereas an excise tax is applied just to a specific item. And so another example of an excise tax are the uh, special taxes that are applied to cigarettes. Uh, so the current excise taxes on cigarettes in the state of New York, for example, it's $4.35 a pack in the state. And then if you go into the city, um, I think it's another 3 or $4 a pack in city taxes on cigarettes in New York. Uh, now compare that to, for instance, like Kentucky, where in Kentucky, they're only charging $0.60 cents per pack on cigarettes. Missouri is even less, $0.17 cents a pack. So why do you think cigarettes are taxed separately? Why not just charge the ordinary sales tax? Why this over and above on something like um, gasoline has an excise tax, cigarettes have an excise tax? Why is it? 
What do you mean, the availability? Okay. Yeah, I, I think you're right that places where they grow tobacco, they're less likely to tax it. But I think it's maybe a secondary relationship and not a primary relationship. Like in the first place, why would, why would states want to tax cigarettes? Well, for one thing, taxes discourage consumption. And cigarettes are bad for you, right? I hope nobody's surprised by that. Uh, smoking is really bad for your health. And so number one, the tax discourages the thing, uh, and that's good. It's good for society if people are discouraged from smoking. Uh, and secondly, is it allows you to collect revenue to put towards the costs that are incurred by that thing. And so let's use the gas first in the, as an example. Um, fuel taxes, driving is bad because uh, it's bad for the environment, you know, it's bad for the atmosphere, it's bad for water quality, it's bad for noise. So driving it has some, ec some environmental harm, and it's better if we drive less than if we drive more. You know, driving allows you to do good things, like go to the hospital, go to the work, but if you can minimize the number of miles driven, then generally that's an improvement. It reduces congestion. So it's better if we drive fewer miles. But then we also need revenue to work on the roads. And so the, the uh, gasoline taxes, the excise tax goes towards a specific purpose. And the same thing is true here for the excise taxes on cigarettes, is generally those excise taxes are used to go towards uh, health. Um, so it's funding that goes towards uh, building up Medicare, Medicaid, because uh, smokers disproportionately have higher health, co higher health care costs, and uh, oftentimes they're on uh, like state supported insurance programs. And so by having a big tax on cigarettes, that allows the people who are going to use more of the health care resources to pay a little bit more into the funding for those uh, health care programs. So that's kind of like the rationale for people who uh, are in favor of excise taxes. They're saying it allows you to collect a little extra money for a specific thing. Another example of an excise tax is on uh, sporting good equipment. It's used to, uh, like for example, ammunition, guns. Um, it goes to support uh, the protection of wildlife and reintroduction of um, species like turkey in areas where turkey uh, didn't used to live, or uh, you know they've started reintroducing elk into Kentucky, and I think parts of southern West Virginia occasionally have elk sightings. And so, like uh, there's a sporting goods excise tax uh, that's supporting uh, natural resources. So if you add up all of the excise taxes on things like alcohol, uh, fuel, let's see, what is this? Uh, okay, tobacco, alcohol, motor fuels, um, also includes excise taxes or selective sales taxes on amusements, insurance premiums, peri mutuals, public utilities. And so there are some excise taxes that uh, here in West Virginia applies to uh, um, insurance, like car insurance, and it's only a couple of dollars per year, but it's like a special line item that's a, over and above the normal payment. Uh, so here in West Virginia, we have relatively high excise taxes. We're number six in the nation, $787. Um, I don't remember looking at who is the lowest. Vermont is the highest, $1,000 a year. Who's the lowest? Arizona, ah, $303 a year, all right. So it's interesting to look at, uh, you know, different states have different ways of collecting um, taxes, and I think a big portion of it is probably the fuel tax, because if you look, South Carolina is low, and it's largely because their, uh, their fuel taxes are low, remember, and let's check on the cigarettes. Cigarette taxes in South Carolina are also low. So, all right, so let's talk about taxes. An excise tax is a federal tax that's applied just to certain goods and services. They're considered sometimes non-necessities or uh, they're considered independent of the output and profit of a company. So we've talked about how excise taxes uh, sometimes are used to discourage consumption of something that we think of as bad. 
Sometimes they're called a sin tax. Has anybody heard that before, sin tax? And so alcohol, tobacco, sometimes there are excise taxes, I think, on gambling. Um, sales taxes are a percentage of the purchase of goods and services levied by state, municipality, and county governments. By the way, we didn't mention that uh, you know, here in the tri-state area, there is a local sales tax in Huntington that's higher than the state sales tax. And so if you buy something in Huntington, you have to pay 7% sales tax. But if you buy something in Ona, it's only 6% sales tax. Not a lot of places to shop in Ona, but <laughs> there's a few. Uh, property taxes are uh, assessed on the value of property. And we're going to go through some property tax calculations in today's in-class exercise. And income taxes are based on the, uh, the earnings that you've made. And we'll spend all of next class period talking about income taxes. OK, so uh, property taxes. Um, I'm going to show you a page where we can look up for Cabell County what are the property taxes. Here in the FAQ, it tells you the property taxes in the city of Huntington, in rural unincorporated areas, Barbersville, and Milton. So there's only three cities in Cabell County. And if you're not in those city limits, then you're considered a rural area. Um, and in the cities, class two is if it's owner-occupied. Class four is if it is occupied by a renter. And then in rural areas, class two is owner-occupied. And class three is occupied by a renter. And these rates, the way it works, if we go back to the, uh, to the slide here, is every property has an appraised value. And that's where uh, somebody comes out to your property every few years, and they know the square footage you've got. They look at the condition of the property. They know what the, the past sales price was. And they say what they think the property is worth. And then if you multiply that by 60%, that appraised value by 60%, then that's the assessed value. So your assessed value is 60% of the appraised value. And then you multiply that by this tax rate we were just looking at divided by 100. And so, for example, if you are an owner occupied, if you own your home and you're living in it, then you would take the, uh, the appraised value, multiply it by 60%, get the assessed value, and then you pay 1.6946% of the appraised value, no, of the assessed value. And that's how much your taxes are. All right, so I'm going to leave this formula up so that you have it available as you work through the in-class exercise. Um, what I'd like us to do is start on the back side of the paper for this in-class exercise. So start on uh, the, property the property tax section and uh, do property tax, sales tax, and then turn over to the front side. And you can start working on the excise tax. All right, so I've got this solution up on the screen there if you want to check to see whether you've got the right numbers. Remember, our first step is to turn the appraised value into an assessed value. So if the uh, appraised value is 200000 
then the assessed value will be 60% of that. And so then we multiply that assessed value by the tax rate of 1.3746 for class 2 owner-occupied, and that should be divided by 100. Otherwise, the tax is going to be awfully high. Uh, <coughs> so this home would pay $16.49.52 as its property tax. The thing is, is that they are awfully generous in appraising the value of your home. Even if your house did sell for $200,000, I don't know why, but their appraised values are so low. And you can actually look up another part of the Cabell County Assessor's website is you can put in somebody's name, like if you know their name, and it'll find their house, and they'll tell you how much their house is appraised for, and it'll tell you if they're paying their property taxes. All that stuff's fully transparent. So you can find out if your neighbors are paying their property taxes or if they're behind on their property taxes and that sort of thing. Um, but t property taxes in Cabell County are awfully low. Uh, we're really fortunate that, that our taxes aren't nearly, I mean, just to, by point of comparison, um, I think when my parents were living in Kansas City when I was in high school, uh, they were paying like $6,000 a year in property taxes, and that was a long time ago. Um, so 6000 versus less than two, it's a big difference. Okay, let me scroll down to uh, the rest of these calculations here for if it's the city of Huntington and it's rented out, then your property taxes would be 4000 because the city has higher property taxes than the county rural areas. And then uh, owner-occupied gets a discount compared to homes that are rented out. So the property tax would, for that situation would be more than double. And then this part about the libraries, that's kind of another interesting thing of the website, is you can scroll down and it tells you of a certain amount of property taxes, how much goes in which area. And so these property taxes are going towards things that most people are pretty happy about. You know, most people agree that it's a good thing we have education. Uh, most people like EMS so that, you know, when you call 911, somebody's there on the other end to answer. Uh, people like the parks, the health department. I'm not sure, though, why the city of Huntington gets some of the county property taxes. I'm sure there's an explanation there, but... Anyway, the way that you calculate how much is going towards the libraries in this previous example is you find the uh, 4067 which was the overall property tax, and then you go to the table that says what percentage of the tax goes to each category. So the libraries gets 1.27%. So for every dollar of property, for, for every hundred dollars in property taxes, that's collected, $1.27 goes to the library. $61 would go to the schools. So it gives you a relative idea of what your money is being used to support. And then here's the calculation for the sales tax. A granola bar and a container of yogurt would cost you $21.26 at that hotel in San Diego because, number one, I mean, these base prices are ridiculous. A kind bar, you're talking about a granola bar that you could probably buy a package of them in the grocery store, like a package of six for like $3 or so. And so they've got a ridiculous starting price, but then their 21% service fee is kind of like the tip for the person who brings it up from the basement kitchen to your room. So 21% to that person and then there's a $4 guest room dining charge. And so they're charging you for the privilege of eating food in your room, presumably because you're just going to spill it everywhere. And so they've got to spend extra time cleaning it up. Maybe that's what that's for. And then on top of it all, there's the San Diego sales tax of 7.75%. And so that's levied on top of all the other fees. So that being the case, um, 
a granola bar and a container of yogurt would cost you $21.26 at the Omni Hotel. Any questions on this uh, back page of calculations in the in-class exercise? Okay, on the front side, I ask you to take a look at uh, the excise taxes. And so you can get data online related to <coughs> how much money was spent on transportation in West Virginia for their 2016 budget. So I give you the link for that. And then, assuming there being 700,000 registered vehicles in the state, we're just asking if you're spending X number of dollars and you're spreading it out over 700,000 vehicles, how much would you have to collect per vehicle if all of that revenue was coming just from the registration expenses? And then the other question is looking at it in terms of what if you were collecting that revenue on the basis of gasoline? How much gas tax would be required? So let me give you some time to work through that, and then I'll pull up the solution in just a few minutes. Okay, so if you look at the budget from 2016, in the state of West Virginia, they spent about $1.2 billion on transportation. So about $1.2 billion, if you were spreading that out just on the registration fees, so you're saying, we're going to try and recover all of that money on the basis of the number of cars that are on the road, then what you'd have to do is you'd have to collect about $1,800 per car uh, to cover that cost. Now, obviously, registration expenses aren't that high. Does anybody know how much it costs to register a vehicle in the state? I think it went up, didn't it? it used to, I thought it used to be 30, but now it's more. But it's definitely not 1,800. That's for sure. I think it's maybe like 50 bucks or something. Yeah. Oh yeah. So this number, yeah, that's an important point. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, so what you see is it says 1.2 million, but they're, they're saying 1.2 million thousands. They just didn't want to put so many zeros in that data table, and so they're keeping track of thousands of dollars. And so you'll notice that this total transportation expenditure that I'm, uh, I'm writing down here, it's 1.2 billion dollars. And so there's going to be the one, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine digits after that. All right. Yeah, I'm glad that came up. So um, the point is, is that they're recovering some revenue from the vehicle registration expenses, but not all of the money that's needed to cover the cost of construction. So what if they just collected it all on the basis of fuel? So here's how you do that. We say how many people there are, 1.8 million people, each of whom consume 458 gallons. And so we calculate the total number of gallons of fuel sold in the state per year. So about 844 million gallons of fuel per year. And if you're trying to raise $1.2 billion off of that 844 million gallons of fuel, then it would be $1.49 per gallon in fuel tax that they should be charging. But if you remember back to that uh, map that I showed you earlier, I think our fuel taxes are not anywhere near that. Let's just double check. But I think it's around 40 cents. 32 cents? Right. So that means there must be some other subsidies, like money coming in from federal or from the general fund that are helping to cover the cost of transportation expenses. OK, so we are out of time for today. In fact, I've kept you one minute late. So I'll give you that one minute back on Thursday. Just as a reminder, uh, what you've got on the horizon is the final exam. And we're going to be talking about the uh, income taxes uh, on Thursday.